when W is divided by minus P, you get a differential, perfect differential, which we call it as D. This is very, very clear. Now, yeah, this is what I said. You multiply all the terms by the integrating factor minus of 1 over P, then you will find that um, the derivatives are same. That means you can, that one minus 1 over P provides the integrating factor for work and dB is equal to dB minus dA. So you can see dB is path dependent. Whereas work is path dependent, a path dependent entity, if you divide by pressure, path dependent entity called work, if you divide by pressure, it becomes path independent. This is some, something very, very clear. Let us do it, let us see whether heat is a path dependent quantity or path independent quantity. So let me, okay, let me um, symbolize um, heat by Q, Q is equal to du minus du. W du is nothing but CVDT, this effective heat capacity at constant volume plus P dV. And this uh, assuming PV is equal to NRT, I can write it as CV plus NRT into dT minus NRT by T into dT. And I differentiate this with respect to pressure, differentiate this quantity with respect to temperature, I find that they are not equal. That means Q cannot be expressed as a perfect differential. What Clausius did was, if I divide heat by temperature, then this quantity is a, can be expressed as the differential of a state function. And that state function, he called it as entropy. This is all the, this is the origin of entropy. You can see, I am dividing Q by T, I am I'm going to call it by a, a new thermodynamic, he discovered a new thermodynamic variable called entropy in this process. So I am dividing the left hand side by T, right hand side by T. You can see if I take the derivative of this with respect to pressure and if I take the derivative of this with respect to temperature, they are equal. So 1 by T provides the integrating factor for Q. And Q by T can be expressed as a perfect differential of a state function which Clausius in the year 1842 named it as entropy. So when, there is a, when the system goes from a thermodynamic state A to thermodynamic state B, the change in entropy is nothing but the entropy at P minus entropy at A, I don't need to bother about what the path that it can take. In fact, the path can be even a non-quasi-static process. It can be an even irreversible process. What all I need to find out the change in entropy is, I have a quantity called entropy, which is a function of the thermodynamic state variable. If I know the entropy at P, if I know the entropy at A, the difference is equal to the heat. And the difference is what it can be. The, change in entropy and heat is T dS. Thus entropy is energy divided by temperature. Okay. It took a very long time for us to identify correctly much later that temperature is another way of measuring energy. So um, change in entropy is energy divided by energy. It's a dimensionless quantity and Boltzmann captured it in a very, very simple way and said that entropy is K log omega, where omega is the number of microstates. So entropy is a dimensionless quantity, but then thermodynamics it has been defined as joules per Kelvin. So to make an equivalent between the statistical mechanical entropy, logarithm of number of microstates, the thermodynamic entropy, we introduce the Boltzmann factor which, is, which takes away the, takes the unit of joules per Kelvin. So entropy is a dimensionless entity. But historically since it has come, this is the origin of entropy, it is joules per Kelvin. That means temperature is another way of, uh, another unit, another way of measuring energy. Okay. Having done this, Clausius said that I can, this whatever Carnot described, that um, heat cannot be completely converted into work, I can do it by a simple statement that the change in entropy is always greater than or equal to zero, and equality obtains when the process is quasi-static and reversible. So, in terms of entropy, Clausius stated the second law as dS is greater than or equal to zero. And of course, for a closed system, this is about for an isolated system. That is spontaneously, whenever a process happens, the entropy always increases. It can never decrease. That means, another way, another popular way of saying it is that you always go from order to disorder, never the other way. So a spontaneous process cannot lead to need to order from a disordered situation. Somehow I am not very comfortable with interpreting entropy as um, 
measure of disorder. That is, how do you measure disorder? That is, uh, I just don't know. That is, like, if some person is mad, how mad he is, uh, there is uh, no measure. So I have my own reservations about calling entropy as a measure of disorder. But then anyway, that is so we are taught, you know. What is entropy? You ask in an in, in interview any student, what is entropy? He will say entropy is a measure of disorder. So I am, it is coming in this sense. Then for a closed system, Klaus has stated the second law as Ds is greater than Q by T. Essentially it seems, it means that when you go from A to B, if you go in a quasi-static reversible way, what do I mean by quasi-static reversible way? You go from thermodynamic state to A to B, during the process you, the system is remaining all the time in equilibrium. If you want the system to remain in equilibrium, that means the process has to be extremely slow. That such a process, I am going to call it as quasi-static, almost static process. You find as if nothing is happening, but slowly something is happening and that's a, it's an idealization. So ds will be equal to q by t. In any process which is not quasi-static, the change in entropy is always greater than what you calculate for a quasi-static process. For a quasi-static process, entropy is q by t. For an irreversible, quasi-static reversible, for an irreversible process, change in entropy is always greater than Q by T. So this is the statement of the second law for a closed system. This is the statement of the second law for an isolated system. Okay. <coughs> Let me not go. There is, an, there is another delightful formulation of the second law. The Carathiodorable principle. I will just state that. Let, let us not go into the details because usually this is not taught in the, in the curriculum. It is about adiabatic inaccessibility. That is in the neighborhood of any equilibrium state, there are states that cannot be reached from A adiabatically. This is um, one statement of the second law and you can show that this is equivalent to the, car, uh, the statement of second law as ds is greater than 0. But I am not going into the details. But keep in mind that if you have an equilibrium system in a thermodynamic state, in the neighborhood of that there are states which to which the system cannot go adiabatically. And it is the existence of um, inaccessibility, that is adiabatic inaccessibility, that is responsible for the existence of the state function called entropy and ds is always greater than zero. So you are going to divide the space in terms of surfaces where from one surface to another surface there is a change in entropy. And you will always go from one surface to another surface of, of um, higher entropy. That's mathematically this is what it means. I am not going into the details. So this is only to say that, that, that there is yet another abstract statement of the second law involving adiabatic analysis. What we will require for our um, for the talk here, I will require second law in terms of free energy and work. So work is equal to, there is a du is equal to w plus q, that is the statement of the first law. Any change in the energy of the system comes from the energy given in terms of heat, coming in terms of energy given in terms of work. So q plus w is equal to du. I am using the convention that work done on the system is positive, work done by the system is negative. If the process is isothermal, that is w is equal to du minus, minus Tds. If it is isothermal, that means temperature does not change. I can write work as d of u minus ts because temperature is a constant. Then u minus ts we, we, we identify immediately u minus ts as a gender transform. Let me not go into the details and simply say that um, that is called the free energy. That is u minus t times s, u as a function of s and v, t as a function of u and v. And this is, sorry, yeah. So I have temperature which is defined as this is the second law definition of temperature. Partial derivative of u with respect to s keeping volume constant. The, the essential take home point is that the change in the free energy in a closed system is equal to the work done. What is the relation between free energy and work in an irreversible process? Is there any relation that I can think in terms of free energy and work when the work is an irreversible process? That is the work done is in a process which is I would like you to stop me at any time if, uh, if uh, I am saying something which you are not able to comprehend, please stop me.
my idea my idea is that i would like to communicate some some excitement i had in doing that work want to communicate a part of that excitement if not the full excitement so i would feel happy to stop me in between if you have any questions okay okay so i am going to prove the relation between free energy and irreversible work so i'm going to start with the closure statement of the second law ds is greater than q by t we have du is equal to q plus w or w greater than du minus t here because i'm going to i'm going to bring w here this is equal to du minus q is equal to t ds only for an irreversible reversible process so w is greater than d of u minus t s if the process is um, irreversible and isothermal so w is greater than t Thus, work done is greater than D F in an irreversible process. In the term, in the reversible limit, I have work done is equal to D F. So keep in mind that if I take the system from a thermodynamic state A to thermodynamic state B in an irreversible way, the work done is always greater than the change in the equilibrium free energy. Thus, we find that the second law of thermodynamics can be stated in several equivalent ways. Lest we forget, let me emphasize the second law is an empirical law based on observation. That was what I was telling you. If you smell the second law, it will smell of human sweat because it is based on observation, experimental observation. Nobody has ever tried to prove the second law, even though Boltzmann made a very glorious attempt to derive the second law from uh, Newton's law and he failed. And I don't think up till now anyone has succeeded in. Um, deriving the second law of thermodynamics starting starting from newton's equations of motion so nobody tried to prove the second law nor did anybody think that it could be violated nobody thought even that it could be violated so there is a i have made an unproven uh, i have made a statement which i cannot prove but you can't find an experiment that violates the second law everyone believed that the second law operates but did not know why why the second law operates all the time then came Boltzmann, who made an entropy a statistical entity rather than a thermodynamic entity, so he was the first to introduce the notion of see statistics was a subject which the mathematicians were indulging in, and most of the time the mathematicians were advisers to kings who play gambling and they were trying to predict what are the chances that you will win and things like that. So physicists had never had never any use for uh, statistics. In fact, there is a very popular statement: there are three kinds of like, statistics, statistics, and statistics. Okay, but it was Boltzmann who, for the first time, showed us that statistics can be used for making predictions about material properties. So he made um, the thermodynamic entropy. entropy as a statistical entity Boltzmann had a hunch that the second law could be derived from the laws of Newton entropy should have a dynamical origin it should have a newtonian dynamical origin he was of the opinion that macroscopic irreversibility can arise from reversible microscopic laws that is starting from newton's equation of motion he derived what is now known as boltzmann transport equation for the phase space density of molecules in a dilemma The dilute gas. Actually, I am not going to get into the details of Boltzmann transport equation. That will take us far away from. Uh, After he formulated the transport equation, then came the trouble. So there were two people. Lars Schmidt's reversibility paradox. He says that an isolated system evolves from time t is equal to zero to tau. If there is a spontaneous decrease in the increase in entropy, he defined actually a Boltzmann Hedge function, which is um, minus of yes. So let us formulate in terms of entropy. So essentially, Lars Schmidt's objection to Boltzmann's claim that he has derived the second law starting from uh, the time reversal invariant Newton's equations was that um, if there is a spontaneous decrease increase of entropy during this evolution then the system since the system obeys time reversal invariant newtonian dynamics it will end up at the same phase space point it started from if you if i reverse all the momentum it will end up at the same 